On August 19, 1942, the 2nd Canadian Division, supported by British commandos and a small unit of American Rangers, made an amphibious assault on the port of Dieppe, on the upper Norman coast, about 100 kilometres from Le Havre. It was a raid, not an invasion. It was poorly planned and badly executed. The Canadians suffered terrible losses. Three quarters of them were killed, wounded or taken prisoner within six hours. All seven battalion commanders were casualties. At Dieppe, the Germans had fortified positions holding 88mm cannon on the cliffs on each side of the beach, plus machine gun pillboxes and entrenched troops. The beach consisted entirely of shingle, impossible for tanks to cross and difficult for men. There had been no pre-assault bombardment from ships or planes. The attacking infantry outnumbered the defenders by only a two-to-one ratio, and the defenders were top-quality troops. Allied propaganda tried to play Dieppe as a rehearsal from which critical lessons were learned, lessons that were applied on June 6, 1944. But in fact, the only lesson learned was do not attack fortified ports head-on. Dieppe was a national disaster. The Canadians owed the Germans a bit of payback. They got it on Juneau Beach. Corsel sur mer in the centre of Juneau Beach, was the most heavily defended point in the long stretch from Aramanches on the far right of the British beaches to Wistraham on the far left. Saint-Aubin and Langrun, to the left, east of Corsel, were well defended also. General Richter's 716th Division had 11 heavy batteries of 155mm guns and 9 medium batteries, mainly 75S. All were supposed to be in fortified bunkers, but only two bunkers were complete. Elsewhere, the crews were protected by unroofed bunkers or earthen gun pits in open fields. There were wider stand nester at Vaux, Courseul, Bernier and Saint-Aubin, each heavily fortified with reinforced concrete. The wider stand nester were supported by trenches and gun pits, surrounded by barbed wire and minefields. All weapons were sighted to fire along the beach in enfilade, not out to sea, the zones of fire were calculated to interlock on the formidable array of beach obstacles situated just below the high water mark. To the Germans, as John Keegan noted, the combination of fixed obstacles and enfilading fire from the resistance nests was deemed to guarantee the destruction of any landing force. But General Richter had some serious problems. His wider stand nester were a kilometre apart. His mobility was practically non-existent. The 716th used horses to move its artillery and supplies, while its men moved by foot. Their weapons were a hodgepodge of captured rifles and cannon. The men were under 18 or over 35 years of age, or veterans of the Eastern Front in their mid-twenties who had suffered more or less disabling wounds, or Ost Battalion troops from Russia and Poland. Their orders were to stand fast. Giving an inch of ground was forbidden, and German NCOs were there to enforce those orders. In any case, the encircling minefields and barbed wire would keep them in just as much as it would keep the Canadians out. Man for man, they were hardly a match for the young, tough, magnificently trained Canadians, and they were outnumbered by the Canadians in the first wave at a ratio of 6 to 1, 2,400 Canadians, 400 Germans. The Canadian 3rd Division contained lumberjacks, fishermen, miners, farmers, all tough outdoorsmen and all volunteers, Canada had conscription in World War II, but only volunteers were sent into combat zones. Sapper Josh Honan volunteered in a way familiar to all veterans. He was a surveyor in an engineer company in Canada in late 1943 when a colonel called him to headquarters. You're Irish, the colonel declared. Yes, sir. An Irishman always likes a good scrap, doesn't he? We got a job we'd like you to do. Honan replied that he would just as soon stay with his company. We're all together, sir. We're going overseas and I don't want to get separated from my mates. Never mind about all that. You may meet them again in England. Honan asked what the job was. The colonel replied that he could not say. The only thing I can tell you about it is that there are many men in England today who would gladly change places with you. Just one will do, Honan responded. Well, you Irish will have your little joke. I can promise you that you will be totally pleased that you took this job. Will I? Oh yes, I know you Irish. You enjoy a good scrap, don't you? In his interview, Honan commented, I wasn't too keen on this jolly good scrap business talk. But there it was. A few days later, he was on his way to England, where he discovered that the job was just about the worst imaginable. 
he was to precede the first wave and blow up beach obstacles. On the night crossing on his LST, Honan noted that the men he was with, the Regina Rifle Regiment, headed toward Mike's sector of Juno, spent their time alternating between using their whetstones to sharpen knives, daggers and bayonets and playing poker. He saw one man who had a knife with a wooden haft covered with leatherwork with a big diamond-like gem inserted into it, sharpening it like mad. Others were playing poker like nothing I'd ever seen before. There was no use in holding back, nothing made any difference, bet the lot. When officers came around, they would sort of cover the money with the blankets they were playing on. Asked if the officers didn't try to stop the men from gambling, Honan said matter-of-factly, you couldn't stop anybody from doing anything at that stage. Honan saw a single ship steaming through his convoy between the rows of ships, and as it passed we could see on the prow the solitary piper silhouetted against the evening sky and the thin lament coming across, we not come back again. It was very touching, and everybody was hushed, and everybody just stood there watching, not a sound from anyone, and then gradually it passed by and faded away in the distance and we often thought that we not come back again. The Canadians were scheduled to land at 7.45 a.m., but rough seas made them ten minutes and more late, and extremely seasick. Death would be better than this, Private Gerald Henry of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles moaned to one of his mates. They had been told in the final briefings that all the pillboxes, machine guns and artillery pieces would be kaput as a result of the air and naval bombardments, but things did not work out that way. The midnight June 5 6 air bombardment by RAF Bomber Command was heavy enough. The 5,268 tonnes of bombs dropped was the heaviest raid the British had yet mounted in the war, but it was woefully inaccurate. American B-17 came over at first light, but as at Omaha they delayed dropping their bombs up to 30 seconds after crossing the aiming point. As a result, the bombs fell well inland, very few of the fortifications were hit, none on Juno. Royal Navy cruisers and battleships began firing at 6 a.m. The destroyers went into action at 6.19 a.m. At 7.10 a.m., the tanks and 25-pounders on LCTs joined in, followed by the rockets from the LCTR. It was the heaviest bombardment ever fired from ship to shore, but the smoke and haze was such that very few of the shells actually hit their targets, a target analysis team later calculated that only about 14% of the bunkers were destroyed. The smoke was so thick that for the most part the German defenders could not see out to sea. At 6.45 AM 7th Army's routine morning report to OB West read, Purpose of naval bombardment not yet apparent. It appears to be a covering action in conjunction with attacks to be made at other points later. Occasionally the wind would sweep away the smoke. When it did, the Germans could see countless ships, ships big and small, beyond comprehension. The bombardment lifted at 7.30 a.m., when the first wave was supposed to be landing. This gave the Germans time to recover and man their guns. All the softening up did was alert the enemy of the landing, Private Henry remarked, and give them the chance to be settled in for our guys to run into. Another soldier in the Royal Winnipeg Rifles commented, the bombardment had failed to kill a single German or silence one weapon. Yet as the Canadian landing craft approached the beach obstacles, mostly underwater due to the strong northwest wind, there was an eerie silence. The Germans were not firing, which the Canadians found encouraging. They did not yet realise the reason was all the German guns were sighted to fire down the beach. Josh Honan was on an LST, waiting to be offloaded onto an LCA for the final run of five kilometres or so to the beach. One of his mates asked, Do you think this might just be a rehearsal? It looks a bit elaborate for that, Honan replied. Honan had his own fantasy, that his demolition team would be forgotten by the officer in charge. It was like being called for the dentist, Honan said. I was hoping that I wouldn't be next, that maybe somebody else would go before me. But then this fellow with the bullhorn called out, Sapper assault team, report to your boat stations on number six deck now. Safely loaded, Honan's LCA joined five others and began to circle. He went to the ramp to watch the action. He noted that all the Canadian soldiers had deeply sun-tanned faces, while the British coxswains and crews were moon-white. He looked for landmarks but could not see any through the smoke. The LCA was pitching and bucking in the waves. The rougher it got, 
Conan said, the less I looked around me to see what was happening to anybody else. The craft started closing up on each other, but not in an organised fashion. The LCAs began losing way and losing steerage, bumping into each other and into beach obstacles. When the leading craft, mostly carrying engineers and UDT teams, reached the outer line of obstacles, a quarter or more of them set off telemines. The mines were not big enough to blow the craft out of the water or otherwise destroy them. The open tops allowed most of the explosive power to escape into the air, but they made holes in the bottoms or damaged the ramps. Honan's LCA came in opposite Bernier-sur-Mer. Honan tried to give the coxswain directions to avoid obstacles, but he hadn't enough steerage for the boat to answer, so we finished up by running on top of one of the obstacles with the ramp up against it. We could see the mine just beside us, one bump and bang. So Major Stone Honan's CO said, I'm going over. I said, bloody good luck to you. But my orders were to try to keep Stoney alive, so I had to go over after him. Honan dumped all his equipment overboard, rifle, explosives, walkie-talkie, the works, and dove into the water after his major. And Stoney was starting to swim for the front of the boat, and I said, bugger it, I've got to do that too. So I swam to the front, and the obstacle was wired onto two adjacent tetrahedrons, and the major had cutting pliers, and he said, I'll cut the wires. And I said, OK, I'll take out the detonators. So I got astride the tetrahedron, wrapped my legs around it, and started to unscrew the detonators. Stoney shouted to get a dozen men off the craft and for the others to go to the stern to help lift the prow off the obstacle. So a dozen soldiers dove in, and we all got our shoulders to the prow and pushed. It was about 8 a.m. The leading LCAs carrying assault teams were dropping their ramps. Canadians were making their way on foot through the obstacles up onto the beach. The Germans commenced firing. Snipers and mortar crews were aiming at the landing craft as machine guns concentrated on the first wave of infantry. Bullets were creating miniature geysers around Honan. He, Major Stone and the men managed to free the LCA. Its ramp went down and the infantry made toward shore as Honan moved to the next obstacle to remove the detonator on its mine. My mates were attacking the pillboxes. That was their business and I was doing my business. I was a sitting duck. I didn't have anything to work with except my bare hands. The rising tide covered the obstacles faster than Honan could unscrew the detonators. Honan remarked, I could do my job only by wrapping my legs around the obstacles to keep from being floated away, and I could only use one hand. At about 8.15am he decided, Bugger this lark, I'm going ashore. He swam for the shore. There he saw a headless corpse. The man had apparently been wounded in the water and then run over by an LCA. The propeller had cut his head off. He was clutching in his hand the knife with a diamond-like gem inserted into the leather wrapped around the handle that Honan had noticed during the night. When Honan reached the seawall, a couple of the chaps hauled him up and over. One of them pulled out a flask of whiskey and offered Honan a drink. No thanks, Honan said. The soldier took a slug himself and asked, Why not? You're not an FNT totaler, are you? I'm not, Honan replied. But I'm afraid that stuff will make me feel brave or some bloody thing like that. Honan moved into the village, where he took shelter until the German machine gun fire was suppressed. I had done my bit, he explained. I was watching the others get on with it. Until the tide receded, he could do no more demolition of obstacles. Soon the guns fell silent and the people began coming out into the street, waving for the liberators, throwing bouquets of roses. The village priest appeared. Monsieur le curé, Honan said in his best high school French, I hope that you are pleased that we have arrived. Yes, the priest replied, but I will be better pleased when you are gone again, as he pointed sadly to the hole in the top of his 17th century church. The barber came out and asked Honan if he would like a cognac. No, Honan replied, but I could do with a shave. The barber was happy to comply, so I went in and sat in the chair in my ringing wet battle dress, the water squelching in my shoes, and he gave me a shave. Refreshed and rested, Honan returned to the beach to go back to work. I was in time to see the DD tanks coming ashore. Two of them came out of the water. I had never seen nor heard of them before. So this was like sea monsters for me coming out of the deep. Those two tanks pulled up their skirts and ducked around the village with the other girls. Sergeant Ronald Johnston was a tank driver. 
At 5 a.m. out in the channel in the Anchorage area, he offloaded from an LST onto a Rhino ferry, an experience he found disconcerting as he had not done the manoeuvre previously, and the steel tracks slipped on the steel deck of the Rhino, and his tank almost plunged into the sea. Finally, he got to his designated position. There was a jeep in front of him. Johnston walked up to the jeep driver and asked, That jeep is waterproofed, isn't it? Yeah, why? I sure as hell hope so, because if it stalls, I'm going right over the top of it. When the ferry made the shoreline, Johnston recalled, the jeep driver all but broke his neck looking back to make sure the Sherman tank wasn't coming on. The jeep made it okay, Johnston right behind. He was horrified when he made the shore and discovered he had to run over dead and wounded infantry. We just had to put it out of our minds, he commented. Just forget it. There was only one way forward. Johnston's tank carried two motorcycles strapped onto the exhaust pipes and was towing an ammunition trailer. Cordite was wrapped around the waterproofing and exhaust pipes, all connected by wire. When the motorcycles were removed, Johnston got the word from the tank commander to hit the button that ignited the cordite and blew the waterproofing off. It made a hell of an explosion. On the beach, it was unreal. Machine gun fire, mostly wild. A lot of the infantry were still in the water and they couldn't get in. They took cover behind the tanks. A commando officer told Johnston to turn left. I looked and I said, oh my God, no. The commando asked why not. Johnston replied, I'm not going to run over any more of my own buddies today. Sergeant Tom Plum was with a mortar platoon of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. He went in on an LCT. When the ramp dropped and the tanks drove off, the LCT was pushed back into deeper water. The skipper nevertheless ordered the sergeant in charge of the first section to drive off in his mortar carrier. The sergeant protested that the water was too deep, but the skipper was adamant. The first carrier drove off and immediately sank in four metres of water. The men came floating up, choking and cursing. The skipper ordered the next carrier off, but the sergeant rebelled and demanded a dry landing. The skipper threatened him with a court-martial, but the sergeant held fast. Finally, the skipper conceded, raised the ramp, circled, came in again, and Plum and the others made a dry landing. That landing craft commanding officer was later given a dishonourable discharge, Plum commented with some satisfaction. The skipper had reason to be hesitant, reason to want to pull that famous naval manoeuvre known as getting the hell out of there. All around him, all across Juno Beach, landing craft were setting off telemines. Many did so coming in, more did so when their troops and vehicles disembarked, because they then floated higher in the water and wave action pushed them against mined obstacles. Half or more of the craft at Juno were damaged, a quarter sunk. Sergeant Siggy Johnson of the Regina Rifles was first out of his LCA. It had stuck on a sandbar. When Johnson took a couple of steps forward, he was in over his head. Then a swell came along and it lifted the boat and it went right over the top of me. He paused in his interview, shook his head and said with wonder in his voice, and I'm still here telling about it. One of his mates was hit in the stomach and the legs. Despite his wounds, he went straight for a pillbox. He shot one of the gunners, and the other one, he got his hands around his throat. He strangled the German, then he died himself, and when we found him, he still had his hands around the German's throat. A DD tank swam ashore, dropped the skirts, and began blasting with its 75mm cannon. Unfortunately, the tank had blasted at some Canadian infantry. Johnson got over to the tank and was able to get the captain to cease fire. Asked how the friendly fire could have happened, Johnson replied, That tank was one of the first ones in, and they saw troops, and I guess everybody's uniform was black from being wet anyway, and they just started firing. Johnson pointed to a 37mm gun in front of a building, and got the tanker to blast it. For the infantry assault teams, it was a matter of chance whether they landed on their sector before any tanks got ashore, or landed side by side with tanks, or followed tanks ashore. In general, the DD tanks were late, if they arrived at all, while skippers of LCTs who decided to hell with the orders, we are going all the way in, put their tanks in even as the UDT men started working on the obstacles. It was also a matter of chance whether the infantry landed dry or in deep water. Sergeant McQuaid, an Irishman, jumped off his ramp into neck-deep water. Amid many other curses, he shouted, Oh, the evil of it! 
They're trying to drown me before I even get up on the beach. The Germans opened fire as the infantry made their way through the obstacles up to the seawall. The Canadians in the first wave took dreadful casualties, in some companies every bit as bad as the first wave at Omaha. B Company of the Winnipegs was cut down to one officer and 25 men before it reached the seawall. D Company of the Regina Rifles lost half its strength even before it reached the beach. The regimental historian described the scene. A company found the bombardment had not cracked the huge casemate on their sector. This fortress had reinforced concrete walls four feet thick and housed an 88mm gun as well as machine guns. In addition, there were concrete trenches outside the fort, liberally sprinkled with small arms posts. Men survived by getting behind tanks until they could reach the seawall. The Queen's own rifles landed at Bernier, accompanied by DD tanks from the Fort Gary Horse, 10th Armoured Regiment. Sergeant Garieppi drove one of the tanks. More by accident than by design, he recalled. I found myself the leading tank. On my way in, I was surprised to see a friend, a midget submarine who had been waiting for us for 48 hours. He waved me right onto my target. I remember him very, very distinctly standing up through his conning hatch, joining his hands together in a sign of good luck. I answered the old familiar army sign. To you too, bud. I was the first tank coming ashore and the Germans started opening up with machine guns. But when we came to a halt on the beach, it was only then that they realised we were a tank when we pulled down our canvas skirt, the flotation gear. Then they saw that we were Shermans. It was quite amazing. I still remember very vividly some of the machine gunners standing up in their posts looking at us with their mouths wide open. To see tanks coming out of the water shook them rigid. Garipi's target was a 75mm gun firing enfilade across the beach. Infantry got behind him as he drove his tank forward. The houses along the beach were all full of machine gunners and so were the sand dunes, but the angle of the blockhouse stopped them the crew of the 75mm from firing on me. So I took the tank up to the emplacement, very, very close, and destroyed the gun by firing at almost point-blank range. The infantry following Garipi gained the relative safety of the seawall. In the midst of this uproar, the pipers with the Canadian Scottish Regiment piped away. The pipers had played the regiment out of the harbour when they left England, played again as they clambered into their assault boats, and yet again as they hit the beach. CPL and Robert Rogg was an American who had joined the Canadian Army in 1940, he went in with the Black Watch, Royal Highland Regiment. It was something, he recalled. While I was wading on shore, I could hear one of our pipers playing Bonnie Dundee on the ship behind us, and we were really getting piped into action. Private G.W. Levers of the Canadian Scottish Regiment kept a diary. He jotted notes in it as best he could as his LCA moved towards shore. Craft is bobbing around like a cork. We are not due to touch down until 7.45 a.m., as we gradually near the shore, we can see the different ships firing, also batteries of rockets firing. When they go off, there is a terrific flash of flame. We are within half a mile of shore by now, and several of the chaps are quite seasick. The engines are speeded up and we are making our run for the shore. We can see the beach, although the seas are running high. We can see a big pillbox with the shells bursting around it, and apparently doing no damage at all. The machine gun bullets are starting to whine around our craft and the boys are keeping their heads down. Here we go, the ramp is down. Levers tucked his diary away and went down the ramp. Later, catching his breath at the seawall, he pulled it out and wrote, We were in water up to our waists and sometimes up to our chests. We waded ashore and it was pretty slow work. We hit the beach and machine guns were making us play hopscotch as we crossed it at the walk. As Levers' experience indicates, the initial assault at Juneau was like the initial assault at Omaha, but once the Canadians reached the seawall, there were significant differences. There were more tanks on Juneau, especially more specialised tanks designed to help the infantry over the seawall, which was considerably higher at Juneau than at Omaha, through the barbed wire and across the minefields. The flanking fire was as intense at Juneau as at Omaha, and the fortified pillboxes and gun emplacements just as numerous and formidable. At Omaha, one in 19 of the men landed on D-Day became casualties. Nearly 40,000 went ashore. There were 2,200 casualties. At Juneau, one in 18 were killed or wounded. 21,400 landed. 1,200 were casualties. 
The figures are misleading in the sense that most men landed in the late morning or afternoon at both beaches, but a majority of the casualties were taken in the first hour. In the assault teams at both beaches, the chances of being killed or wounded were close to one in two. The biggest difference between the beaches was that at Juno there was no bluff behind the seawall. Once across and through the villages, the Canadians were in relatively flat, open country with few hedgerows, few fortifications and almost no opposition. The trick was to get over the seawall and through the villages. That was where Hobart's funnies came into play. Tanks carrying bridges put them up against the seawall. Flail tanks beat their way through minefields. Tanks with bulldozers pushed barbed wire out of the way. Churchill crocodile tanks towing 400 gallons of fuel in armoured trailers, with a pipeline under the belly to the flame guns in front, shot out streams of flame at pillboxes. Tanks carrying fascines dropped them into the anti-tank ditches, then led the way over. Sergeant Ronald Johnston drove his tank up to the seawall. His captain fired 40 rounds of armour-piercing ammunition against it, cutting it down. A bulldozer cleared away the rubble. Johnston drove through and reached the street running parallel to the beach. The tank was buttoned up. Johnston was looking through a periscope. He did not see a slit trench. And I went left and the damn track went in the slit trench and there we sat. But the Lord was with us. The tank came to a halt in a position that had its .50 caliber machine gun looking right down the throat of some German infantry in the trench. The gunner gave a blast, killing or wounding a few Germans. Twenty-one other Germans put their hands up. Another British tank came through the gap, hooked onto Johnston's tank and pulled it out of the trench. Captain Cyril Hendry, the troop commander who had unfolded his bridge on the LCT so that it would not act as a sail, was terrifically busy on the run into shore. Getting all our tanks started up, warmed up, lifting that damn bridge, getting everybody into position, making sure all the guns were loaded and this sort of thing, everybody so flaming seasick it was rough. When he drove off the ramp, he was pleased to see an armoured bulldozer already on the beach, using its winch to pull barbed wire off the seawall. I had to drop my bridge on the sand dunes so that the other tanks could climb and drop down on the far side. The first of the funnies to cross began flailing a path for the follow-up vehicles and infantry. When the flail tank reached this bloody great hole of a tank trap, it turned aside to allow a Sherman carrying a fascine to move forward and drop the fascine into the hole. Then the Sherman started to cross, only to slide down into an even deeper hole, evidently created by a naval shell. Hendry drove forward with his bridge, which had a 30-foot reach. The combination tank trap and crater was 60 feet wide, Hendry used the turret of the sunken tank as a pier. After he got his bridge in place, the far end resting on the sunken Sherman, another bridge carrying tank crossed, and also using the sunken tank for support, dropped its bridge to reach the dry ground on the far side. By 9.15am the two bridges resting on the sunken tank were secure enough for flail tanks to cross. Infantry came after them and rushed the houses from which machine gun fire was coming. The Canadian infantry moved across the seawall and into the street fighting in the villages or against pillboxes, with a fury that had to be seen to be believed. One who saw it happen was PVT Gerald Henry. His company of the Royal Winnipegs was scheduled to land at 8am, but it was late, so he was an observer for the initial action. His comment was to the point, it took a great deal of heroics and casualties to silence the concrete emplacements and the various machine gun nests. Sergeant Siege Johnson saw one of the bravest acts possible in war. A pioneer platoon was held up by barbed wire. It was supposed to use a Bangalore torpedo to blow a gap, but the torpedo failed to explode. A soldier, unknown to Johnson, threw himself over the wire so that others could cross on his back. Johnson saw others crawl through barbed wire and minefields to get close enough to the embrasures of pillboxes to toss in grenades. He concluded his interview with these words. Very few publications ever get the truth of what our Winnipeg infantry faced and did. Every platoon in the Canadian assault companies had an assigned sector in the villages to attack. In some cases they met almost no resistance once over the seawall. Company B of the Regina Rifles, for example, cleared the east side of Courseul in a matter of minutes. But a company, at the western side, was held up and badly hurt by machine guns, an 88mm gun beside the harbour entrance, and a 75mm out to the right flank. 
Fortunately, 14 of the 19 DD tanks launched by B Squadron of the 1st Hussars provided support for the infantry, who worked their way through the trenches and dugouts connecting the concrete positions. Sergeant Gariepi nearly got stuck in Courseul. His tank ended up in a narrow street, and there was one of those funny-looking trucks with a charcoal burner on the running board. I couldn't get my tank by, and I saw two Frenchmen and a French woman standing in a doorway looking at us, so I took my earphones off and told them in good Quebec French, Now will you please move that truck out of the way so I can get by? They must have been frightened because they wouldn't budge, so I then called them everything I could think of in the military vocabulary. They were amazed to hear a Tommy. They thought we were Tommies, speak French with the old Norman dialect. But they finally moved the truck, and Garipi was able to push inland. B Company of the Queen's Own Regiment, attacking Bernier, also ran into undamaged fortifications. Before it was able to get around and behind the guns and put them out of action, it took 65 casualties. But within an hour, Courseul and Bernier were in Canadian hands. The North Shore, New Brunswick Regiment assault teams, hit Saint-Aubin. Within an hour, a company on the right cleared its immediate front with a loss of 24 men. B Company, attacking the village itself, ran into a reinforced concrete casemate with steel doors and shutters, with well-prepared entrenchments around it and 100 German soldiers inside. Not until tanks lobbed several 25-pound petards against the bunker and cracked the concrete to stun the defenders did the Germans surrender. Half the garrison was by then dead or wounded. As at Omaha, strong points that the attackers thought they had cleared came alive after the Canadians passed through. Germans infiltrated via their trench system back into the positions and resumed the fight. Within the villages, the Germans would pop up at one window, then another, fire a round or two, then disappear. Street fighting, sometimes heavy, sometimes sporadic, went on through the day. The North Shore assault teams did not have Saint-Aubin fully secured until 6pm follow-up waves came in steadily. Many of the men in them carried bicycles, which in some cases actually worked, although by the end of the day most of the bikes had suffered the fate of most of the gas masks carried ashore, that is, they were discarded. Using the bikes and their feet, the reinforcements passed over the seawall and through the villages to dash forward and seize crossroads and bridges inland. C Company of the Canadian Scottish reached the area between Saint Croix and Banville, where follow-up elements of the Royal Winnipegs were involved in a firefight with German defenders. A platoon commander from the company described what happened. An LMG light machine gun which sounded like a Bren opened up from a position about 150 yards away. We hit the dirt and I shouted, this must be the Winnipegs. When I say up, all up together and shout Winnipegs. We did, and to our surprise two enemy infantry sections stood up. They too were a picture of amazement. Their camouflage was perfect, and it was no wonder we did not see them earlier. But the stunned silence did not last long. There was only one course of action, and to a man the platoon rushed the enemy position. It was a bitter encounter with much hand-to-hand -hand fighting. At 9.30 a.m. the 12th Field Regiment, Royal Canadian Artillery, began landing. The gunners drove their self-propelled 105mm guns onto the beach, lined them up only a few metres inland and began firing, sometimes over open sights. The assault sappers from the Royal Canadian Engineers, meanwhile, were clearing the beach and opening exits, allowing tanks and other vehicles to move inland. By 12pm the entire Canadian 3rd Division was ashore. The Winnipegs and Reginas, supported by tanks, had penetrated several kilometres inland and captured the bridges over the River Soule. No German tanks had been seen. Early in the afternoon, the Canadian Scottish had passed its leading battalion through the Winnipegs and captured Colombia sur seul Sergeant Stanley Dudka of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders landed at 11am. Our instructions were to break through immediately hitting the beachhead, to stop at nothing, not to fight unless we had to, but to get to Carpiquet Airport, just west of Caen, 15 kilometres inland, and to capture and consolidate the airport. For a variety of reasons, the Highlanders did not get that far, or even close to Carpiquet. Dudka explained that first of all his platoon was held up on the beach by German fire and congestion, and did not get started inland until 2pm. When the Highlanders did move, they had only got a couple of kilometres inland when it was time for tea. 
The British and Canadian armies can't fight three and a half minutes without tea, according to Robert Rogg, the American volunteer in the Black Watch. Dudker brewed up his tea and met his brother Bill, also a Highlander. We had our tea together and cautioned each other to be careful, like brothers do. Then we started on our way. The march was slow, as each man was carrying approximately 90 pounds of gear, landmines, ammunition and weapons. The tanks got too far ahead of us at times, Dudka went on. This was caused by the anxiety of Canadians to get into the action. When the Highlanders were about halfway to Carpiquet, it was 8pm orders came down to dig in for the night, put out patrols and prepare for a counter-attack. Another cause of delay was the tendency to stop to loot, always the bane of infantry commanders trying to hurry their men forward. Corporal Rogger noted that as the Black Watch moved through the farmhouses that the Germans had been using for billets, men would break away from the column to do a bit of looting. Luger pistols, binoculars and cloth swastikas were the most sought-after items. Sergeant Dudka described a further problem. The grass and wheat in France was ready to be cut, and the visibility was nil. When we dug in or laid down, we had no visibility whatsoever, just a bunch of grass in front of you. You couldn't see where the others were at. We had not been prepared for that. Private Henry of the Winnipegs called it a very slow day. We were sort of on the move all day, but didn't travel very far without stopping to take cover in ditches or whatever cover was available. My first day in France was one of amazement. I seemed to always be far enough away from danger, yet was always a part of it. When we dug in for the night, it was a welcome stop. At the end of the day, Private Leavers brought his diary up to the minute. After making it to the seawall and resting for a few minutes, his platoon cut the wire and started inland. We keep moving along, have to cross six or seven tank obstacles. They are ditches four to five feet deep and six to eight feet across and filled to the brim with water. There is a heavy machine gun firing up ahead and we go off on the left flank to try and round him up. On completing that task, we start out immediately for our second objective. We bypass two big straw stacks which are in reality pillboxes. We leave them for the troops coming up behind. Two Germans appeared in a barley field and came in with their hands in the air. There are two more hiding in the field, so we start looking for them with the bayonet. I happen to come across him first and am just going to sink the bayonet home when he shouts, Rusky. I pulled up my rifle when the bayonet was about two inches from his chest and turned him over to our officer. Levers's platoon kept moving. It spotted a machine gun and closed the distance. As we get close, we come under a crossfire of machine guns. By this time I am pretty cocky and have all the confidence in the world. I was ahead of my section, which was in the lead and was on the right flank. We were in grass, which gave us cover from the machine gun fire. I crawled up to a barbed wire fence, which was about a hundred yards from an enemy slit trench. I saw a Bosch well exposed and like a sucker raised myself to take aim. I drew a nice bead and was just squeezing the trigger when a machine gun bullet smacked me down. It hit me in the right leg and went through the thigh from left to right. Two inches higher and I would have stopped being a man. Levers crawled back to his platoon. A medic dressed his wound. Soldiers in German uniforms came across the field, hands in the air. They were Poles and Russians. Levers was put to guarding them. Eventually he was carried back to the beach and transported by landing craft to a hospital ship. By evening June 7th he was back in England, where he had started out on the afternoon of June 5th. Shortly after 6pm, the North Nova Scotia Highlanders reached Beni sur mer five kilometres inland. There the Canadians were greeted by the sight of excited French civilians looting German barracks. Men were carrying off bags of flour, wheelbarrows full of army boots, bread, clothes, furniture. Women were taking chickens, butter, sheets and pillows. The parish priest was helping to liberate a set of dishes. The French took time off from their looting to offer the Canadians glasses of milk and wine. The Canadians pushed on to the south, against light resistance. One troop of 1st Hussar tanks crossed the Cambayo Railway, 15 kilometres inland. It was the only unit of the Allied invasion force to reach its final objective on D-Day but it had to pull back because the infantry had not kept up. The tanks refuelled and stocked up on ammunition to prepare for the expected counter-attack. To the west, the Canadian Scottish had made a 10-kilometre penetration and linked up with the British 50th Division at Crowley. 
Between them, the British 50th Division and the Canadian 3rd had landed 900 tanks and armoured vehicles, 240 field guns, 280 anti-tank guns, and over 4,000 tonnes of stores. The Canadians had failed to reach their D-Day objective to the south, the N-13, while to the east there was a four to seven kilometre gap between the Canadians and the British 3rd Division at Sword Beach. The reasons the Canadians did not achieve all their objectives were many. For a start, the objectives had been wildly optimistic, especially for men going into combat for the first time. They were late in hitting the beaches. The high tide and strong wind hampered the landings. The obstacles were more formidable than expected. Canadian engineers complained that the obstacles off Juno Beach were much heavier, stronger and more numerous than those they had practised against in England. The air and sea bombardments had been disappointing. The schedule for landing was too tight. Too many vehicles were brought ashore too soon, creating congestion that took hours to straighten out. As a consequence, the attack lost its initial momentum. Finally, once ashore and through the villages, there was a tendency for men to feel that they had done their bit. The German soldiers encountered by the Canadians gave cause for optimism. They were young or old, Pole or Russian, not the tough, fanatical Nazis the Canadians had anticipated. Wehrmacht prisoner of wars were a dispirited, sorry-looking lot, but the Canadians knew the Germans had better troops in the area, especially the 21st Panzer Division, and they anticipated strong, determined counterattacks, so they dug in short of their objectives. But as John Keegan writes of the Canadian 3rd Division, at the end of the day its forward elements stood deeper into France than those of any other division. Insofar as the opposition the Canadians faced was stronger than that at any other beach save Omaha, that was an accomplishment in which the whole nation could take considerable pride. After two years, the Canadians had given the Wehrmacht a payback for Dieppe. Sword Beach ran from Lyon-sur-Mer to Wistraham at the mouth of the Oran Canal. In most areas there were vacation homes and tourist establishments just inland from the paved promenade that ran behind the seawall. There were the usual beach obstacles and emplacements in the sand dunes, with mortar crews and medium and heavy artillery pieces inland. Primarily, however, the Germans intended to defend Sword Beach with the 75mm guns of the Merville Battery, and the 155mm guns at Le Havre. But Lieutenant Colonel Otway's 6th Airborne Division men had taken and destroyed the Merville battery, and the big guns at Le Havre proved to be ineffective against the beach for two reasons. First, the British laid down smoke screens to prevent the Germans ranging. Second, the Le Havre battery spent the morning in a duel with HMS Warspite, which it never hit, a big mistake on the Germans' part as the targets on the beach were much more lucrative. Nevertheless, the 88mm on the first rise, a couple of kilometres inland, were able to put a steady fire on the beach to supplement the mortars and the machine gun fire coming from the windows of the seaside villas and from pillboxes scattered among the dunes. In addition, there were anti-tank ditches and mines to impede progress inland, as well as massive concrete walls blocking the streets. These defences would cause considerable casualties and delay the assault. The infantry assault teams consisted of companies from the South Lancashire Regiment, Peter Sector on the right, the Suffolk Regiment, Queen Sector in the middle, and the East Yorkshire Regiment, Roger Sector on the left, supported by DD tanks. Their job was to open exits through which the immediate follow-up wave, consisting of troops of commandos and more tanks, could pass inland to their objectives. Meanwhile, UDT units and engineers would deal with the obstacles. Other regiments from the British 3rd Division scheduled to land later in the morning included the Lincolnshire, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Royal Ulster Rifles, the Royal Warwickshire, the Royal Norfolk and the King's Shropshire Light Infantry. H hour was fixed for 7.25am on the run into the beach. Brigadier Lord Lovat, Colorado of the Commando Brigade, had his piper, Bill Millen, playing Highland Reels on the forecastle on his LCI. Major C.K. King of the 2nd Battalion, the East Yorkshire Regiment, riding in an LCA, read to his men the lines from Shakespeare's Henry V, On, on, you noble English, whose blood is fet from fathers of war-proof. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit. D.D. tanks were supposed to land first, but they could not swim fast enough because of the tide. 
LCTs and LCAs passed them. At 7.26 a.m. the first LCTs began touching down, accompanied by the LCAs carrying the infantry assault teams. Sporadic machine gun and mortar fire, accompanied by 88mm shells fired from inland, greeted them, not so heavy as at Juneau or Omaha, much heavier than at Utah and Gold. Royal Marine frogmen jumped over the sides of their craft and went to work on the obstacles as infantry descended into the surf over the ramps and worked their way ashore. Casualties were heavy, but a majority of the assault teams managed to make it to the dunes. Although some of the men were shocked into a temporary helplessness, most began to put out suppressing fire against the emplacements. Shermans and Churchills, firing their .50 calibre machine guns and 75mm cannon, were a great help, and they provided some protection for the men crossing the beach. Major Kenneth Ferguson was in the first wave of LCTs. He was on the far right, opposite Lyon-sur-Mer. His craft was hit by a mortar bomb. Ferguson had tied a motorcycle beside the turret of his Sherman. The bomb set off the petrol in the tank of the cycle and put the craft in great danger, as it contained ammunition carriers, bangalores and petrol drums. Ferguson told the coxswain to back off and drop the ramp, so as to put the deck cargo awash. Then he drove his tank down the ramp. Immediately behind Ferguson came a bridge-carrying Sherman. A German anti-tank gun took them under fire. The Sherman drove right up to it and dropped its bridge directly onto the emplacement, putting the gun out of action. Flail tanks went to work, clearing paths through the mines. They drove off the beach flailing, Ferguson said. They flailed straight up to the dunes, then turned right flailing and then flailed back to below the high water mark. Other tanks used bangalores or snakes or serpents to blow gaps in the barbed wire and the dunes. Still others of Hobart's funnies dropped their bridges over the seawall, followed by bulldozers and then fascine-carrying tanks that dropped their bundles of logs into the anti-tank ditches. When that task was complete, the flail tanks could cross to the main lateral road, about 100 metres inland, and begin flailing right and left to clear the way for the infantry. We were saved by our flail tanks, Ferguson said. No question about it. Still, the infantry assault teams were stopped by sniper and machine gun fire coming from Lyon sur Mer. The commandos coming in the second wave were supposed to pass right through Lyon and move west to link up with the Canadians at Langrune sur Mer but they too were held up by the German fire. Ferguson's orders were to proceed south toward Caen, but instead he had to turn west to help out at Lyon. I was cross about going to help those commandos. I was angry about that. I was angry at people not getting off the beaches as fast as they could and getting away. People tended to hang around too much. Reflecting on those words, Ferguson went on to say, It seems entirely natural, though. I suppose it could have been done better on D-Day, I don't know. We'd done our bit, though. Taking it all in all, he concluded, we got off the beach bloody quickly, but not through Lyon, where German resistance continued. The Germans had a battery in a wood near Lyon, protected by infantry in trenches and behind sandbags. The commandos could not dislodge the Germans. The battery maintained its fire against the beach. At 2.41pm, the naval forward observer with the commandos got through on his radio to Captain Nalecz Timinski, skipper of the Polish destroyer Slazak. With excitement in his voice, Nalecz Timinski wrote in his action report, the observer said that the commandos were pinned down by heavy enemy fire, that neither they nor himself could raise heads from their foxholes, that the situation was very serious, and that their task was vital for the whole operation. He insistently requested 20 minutes bombardment of each target, commencing with the woods. Nalecz Timinski's orders were not to fire any bombardments unless the fall of shell could be observed and reported by a forward observer. But, in view of the seriousness of the situation, I could not waste the time for requesting permission to carry out bombardment without it being corrected by the forward observer. I ordered my gunnery officer to commence firing at the generally described targets. Slazak blasted away with her four-inch guns for 40 minutes. Nalich Timinski then informed the observer that the bombardment was completed. The observer responded that the Germans were still holding out and requested a further 20 minutes of fire. Slazak did as asked. When that bombardment was completed, we heard on the radio his enthusiastic voice saying, I think you saved our bacon. Thank you. Stand by to do it again. After a bit, another request for support. 
Slazak complied. After that action, the gunnery officer reported to Nalich Timinsky that out of 1,045 rounds of ammunition held in the magazines at the start of the day, only 59 rounds remained. Nalich Timinsky had to break off. He so informed the forward observer, wishing him the best of luck. The observer acknowledged the message and concluded with the words, Thank you from the Royal Marines. Despite the pounding, the Germans in Lyon held on, not only through D-Day, but for two days thereafter. The long gap between Langroon on the Canadian left at Juneau and Lyon on the British right at Sword remained in German hands. Etienne Robert Webb was the bowman on an LCA carrying an assault team to the extreme left of Roger Sector. Going in, we caught one of those obstacles and it ripped the bottom of the craft like a tin can opener. The LCA sank. Webb swam to shore, where I thought, what in the bloody hell am I going to do now? He joined his mates. There was all this activity, bugles sounding, bagpipes playing, men dashing around, the commandos coming in off a landing craft and just moving off the beach as if it was a Sunday afternoon, chatting and mumbling away at whatever they were going to go through to do their little bit of stuff. The beachmaster spotted Webb and his mates and told them to keep out of the way, keep out of trouble, and we will get you off. Webb got ashore at 7.30 a.m. by 8 a.m. There was no fighting on the beach, none at all. It was all inland. Mortars were dropping on the beach, coming from inland, along with shells and occasional sniper fire, all of which the commandos and East Yorks ignored as they went about their business. At 11 a.m. Webb was evacuated by an LCI. Those commandos seen by Webb were French, led by Commandant Philip Kiefer. On June 4th, as they loaded up, the French commandos, men who had been evacuated at Dunkirk four years earlier, or who had escaped from Vichy France to join de Gaulle's Free French, were in a gay mood. No return ticket, please, they had told the military embarkation control officers when they boarded their LST. On the morning of June 6th, they were part of the initial contingent of commandos making the run-in to the beach in LCAs. At the last minute, the commander of the group, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Dawson, Royal Marine Commandos, waved the Frenchmen forward so that they would be the first to set foot on shore. One of those Frenchmen was P.V. Tun Robert Pioge, 24 years old, whose mother lived in Wistraham. He was on LCI 523, commanded by Sub-Lieutenant John Berry, which had got hung up on a beach obstacle. Pioge and the other commando jumped into the sea, so impatient were they to get back to France. Pioge landed in chest-deep water. He waded ashore, the third Frenchman to arrive. Mortars were exploding around him, some heavy shells coming down, a bit of small arms fire, a lot of noise. Pioge made it to shore and got about ten metres across the beach when a mortar exploded beside him, riddling him with shrapnel. He still carries 22 pieces of steel in his body today. His best friend next to him was killed by the same mortar. A British medic examined Pioge's wounds, pronounced him Feeney, gave him a shot of morphine, and moved on to treat men who could be saved. Pioge thought of his mother, who had protested tearfully against his joining the French army in 1939, as her husband had died as a result of World War I wounds. Then he thought of France, and I began to cry, not out of sorrow for myself, nor because of my wounds, but at the great joy that I felt at being back on French soil. He passed out. Pioge was picked up by a medic, carried out to a hospital ship by an LCI, treated for his wounds, and eventually recovered in a hospital in England. He lives today in a seaside apartment in Wistrum. From his living room window he can look out at the spot where he landed. The commandos carried on. Moving with dash and determination, they crossed the seawall and attacked the German defenders at Rivabella and Wistrum, driving them from their pillboxes and fortified houses. They took the heavily fortified casino strongpoint from the rear after bitter fighting. Major R. Pat Porteous, who had won the Victoria Cross at the Dieppe raid, after being wounded in one hand, he led a one-handed bayonet charge, commanded a British troop in number four commando. His task was to go left to the edge of Wistraham, to destroy a German fire control tower in a medieval fortress and a nearby coastal battery, then go to help relieve Major Howard's coup de main party at Pegasus Bridge. Porteous lost nearly a quarter of his men getting over the seawall, either to mined obstacles, mortar fire or machine gun fire coming from a pillbox to his left. We got off that beach as fast as we could. 
We put down smoke grenades which gave us quite a bit of cover to get across the beach. The pillbox was protected by concrete and they were safe as could be, but the smoke let us get over the beach. Porteus turned left on the coastal road, fought his way through the streets, got to the battery and discovered that the guns were telephone poles. We learned afterward from a Frenchman that the battery had been withdrawn about three or four days before D-Day and had been recited some three kilometres inland, Porteus recalled. As we got into the position, they started bringing down fire on the old battery position. We lost a lot of chaps there. Porteus realised that the German observers in the medieval tower were communicating with the gunners at the inland battery. He moved to the bottom of the tower. There was a single staircase up the middle of the tower and these Germans were up on top. They were safe as could be. The walls were ten feet thick. One of his men tried to climb the staircase, but the Germans dropped a grenade on him. Another of Porteus's men fired his Piatti hollow charge missile projectile at the tower, but it failed to penetrate. So the Piatti was useless. We tried to give the German observers a squirt with a flamethrower, but they were too high. We couldn't get enough pressure from those little backpack flamethrowers that we had. There was no way to dislodge the observers. Porteus was taking casualties from rifle fire coming from the tower. He decided to leave it to someone else and set off for Pegasus Bridge. His men did not move very fast. We were still soaking wet, carrying our rucksacks. We really looked like a lot of snails going on, but we met no Germans except a few dead ones lying about. They did meet a few Frenchmen. At one farmhouse, it was very sad. A man rushed out and cried, My wife has been wounded. Is there a doctor? At that moment I heard a mortar bomb approaching. I went flat, and as I got up I saw his head rolling down the road. It was kind of awful. Luckily I had gone down faster. Porteus's troop moved overland toward Pegasus Bridge. There was a big field of strawberries. Most of the chaps waded into the field and began eating strawberries. The poor little French farmer came to me and said, For four years the Germans were here and they never ate one. The troop took time to brew up a bit of tea. One of my subalterns was brewing himself a cup and he had a little tommy cooker thing. He had his mess kit in one hand and a tin of tea in the other, and a mortar bomb went off that blew him head over heels backwards, filled his coffee cup with holes, filled his mess kit with holes. All he had was he was just winded.